Dr. Jared Lim is the um, head of two PLCs, um, and he's been in business a long time. And what is interesting about him is that unlike most traditional businessmen, Dr. Lim is trying to do two seemingly opposing things. He's trying to save the world and trying to build shareholder value. And I think this really could represent the entrepreneur of the future. So do watch this video. Tell me what you think in the comments below. And if you like it and would like to see more of this kind of stuff, please uh, like my video, uh, subscribe to the channel, and uh, tell me what you think in the comments below. Thank you for coming my Do More. All right, Dr. Jerry Lim. Um, well, we've known each other some time, and um, I think you and I are roughly the same age, but you've been in business a lot longer. So I guess uh, the first question really has to focus on your um, entrepreneur life, your entrepreneur journey, right? Um, you're now managing, at last count, two PLCs, um, Sino Ho An and uh, Country Heights. Don't know how you find time for it. Um, but I guess just start at the start and talk to us about your entrepreneur life. How did you get started as an entrepreneur? Chong, <laughs> hi. <laughs> well, very nice to meet you. And it's always a pleasure having these discussions with you. Um, I would say um, it, it really, it's really driven by my sense of curiosity into how things work. And that's, and, 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 and that's really how I've started trying to learn and figure out you know, uh, um, businesses and not just one or two, but how different businesses work. Um, and as, as a result of that curiosity, you know, it's taken me from an analyst to a investment banker to a private equity investor and now um, diving directly into uh, listed companies and businesses itself. Um, you know, that's, it, 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 it's all stemming and driven from that one from that one point, which is that one candle that's lit, which is I want to understand how things work, and when I understand that, how can we make things better? So not every kind of like financial analyst moves into entrepreneur life. Um, bankers generally do that at the end of their very lucrative career, um, but you did the jump very early on, right? Uh, I noticed that. What made you do it? Well, uh, starting as an analyst, and you know the by definition that that position or that or, or that job is to analyze businesses and, and and I started that because I was curious about how different industries worked and then I realized um, it's you know as an analyst you you kind of understand an industry but a lot of the times that information is second or third hand right and so that's when I went uh, into investment banking whereby you're closer to the action you actually see things work you actually you're raising money and advising companies how it works right and then you realize that it's you are in the thick of the action but you're not the action itself right so that's where I you know um, we, I got a couple of partners together and we and we went into uh, private equity and we, ra and we raised a fund and we went into at that time I was very um, I was very interested in consumer media entertainment, and there was something that we that we thought, given the the given the Asian market, uh, at least in Southeast Asia itself, you know that was something that was going to be sus was going to sustainably grow over over the uh, over the long. So, so the dynamics that made you go into business twenty odd years ago, which is the whole. Um, consumer upcycle, middle class, um, the middle classization of Southeast Asia, the consumer play and all that, that's all still very evident, except that now it's like huger than huge, it's bigger than life now, right? Um, so I guess, I guess the best also asking, 20 years of being in business, what are the, do you have your, do you have any regrets? I mean, what are some of the biggest, I think all, all entrepreneurs make mistakes, hopefully some, the, 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 the right decisions outweigh the wrong decisions, but w what are the lessons that you learn? I, if I could borrow from Michael Jordan, yeah. whom, whom is one of my, one of my main basketball idols, he's like, look, the only reason why I succeed yeah. is because I failed or fallen down so many times, right? And I think in business, um, you know, I, th there's no such thing as a, f as a, 
must win or always win kind of formula. Um, I think I've dabbled and got involved in enough um, businesses that have failed a, because of many reasons, from partners to structure to, to just being in the wrong industry. And over the course of the years, I think that's, you know, that's, these lessons have been integrated and ingratiated into my essence and my body. And, and I suppose as a function of growing older, <laughs> being more experienced and uh, hopefully a bit wiser in um, the next business decision that we make. Yeah, because I think fledgling entrepreneurs, they tend to go into businesses which they like and have a passion for but not necessarily ones which are growing the fastest, right? I think media, for example, is something that a lot of people like, but it's something which is so volatile now. Um, you know, so, so if, if you were starting again today, right, what businesses would you go into if you had no strings attached? Where would you put your money into? I would, um, this one uh, phrase or one conversation I had with one of my one of my directors, maybe five, six years ago, I think it's really, uh, he's really stuck in my head. And that's one of the reasons why I've um, really expanded and grown myself and, and really immersed myself into the digital space. And, in, and, and he basically said, look, why, knowing what we know now about how the uh, digital landscape has changed, why, do people still continue to try and swim against the tide, right? Because we know where it's going. Yeah, don't fight the tide. Yeah, go with the flow. How do you, not, not just in business, but life, how do you live life with going with the flow? I think that's so much easier. But in order to do that, you need to dismantle these conditionings and these fixed matrices of what you understand business to be, right? And... I would say, I think if, if, if I had, not that I regret any of my experiences or, or, or mishaps or failures or anything of that, I think it's been a necessity for me to be where I am today. But if I had a choice, you know, say, take it back, you know, eight years ago, I probably would have been a lot more involved in the digital space, you know. So I, I would say I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly late comer to that. Um, but I have taken the opportunity over the last few years to really immerse myself in that and understand how that works and why the future is going to be driven by that. Yeah, she, um, there's a few different points of view. I remember talking to Tan Sri Clement He, uh, East Malaysian guy, ex-journalist like myself, who then went big into education and he was big and I think he started Sagi and he's done property development and he went into the media as well. He said to me, his approach, his, his business mantra is Johnny come lately. He lets people forge the new path, let them make the mistakes, kind of like set the, build a road and then he'll take the road where, where he doesn't have to pay for the costs of making early mistakes. So I think there's, there's no right or wrong. Um, if you had started 20 years ago, you, I mean, you would have had to spend a lot of money in, in the digital space. But now you've got the benefit of, of a certain maturity, right? I mean, I noticed, for example, that Huan, which is now going to be changed to Tecna, Tecna X, right? Um, you have chosen to go into the energy storage uh, area, mm -hmm. which of course is a big global mega trend, right? Um, people are not putting petrol into the cars, maybe in 10 years' time. They'll be using batteries, you know? Um, so that's interesting. But if you try to do that 10 years ago, forget about it. You would have <laughs> had to spend a lot of money. Maybe too much money. Sure. <laughs> Yes, um, I mean, look, it can go either way. Yeah. The fact is, I am where I am now. Yeah. Um, and those experiences, whether or not it's brick and mortar and digital, has helped carve out the, the person that I am now. Yeah. Right? Um, but I would say that I don't think if, I, if I'd taken that step earlier into the digital space, you know, I... I think I would have been a lot more uh, ready uh, to really embrace all these changes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Eastern mystics would say that you are the sum total of everything that you've come uh, from, right? And that you're exactly where you should be and you can't predetermine your outcomes, right? And you're exactly at the stage where you should be. Um, 
I also want to ask you, right? Is it important to have advantages in business? For example, the family, right? The family and, and you're quite related, well connected. Has that been an advantage in terms of be, being in business? I think we all make use of the tools that we have. Of course, yeah. So if we didn't have a family network, we would create our own networks. Um, I, I don't believe there's any one particular type of model that one is naturally born into or, 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 or is endowed that gives them a natural advantage of any, any, anyone else. I think it's ultimately it's all about your attitude, it's all about uh, your, your ability and willingness to learn and absorb things. Yeah, like Forrest Gump said, right? Uh, life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> you just take whatever comes out of the box and you just eat it, right? Um, so what, what advice would you give to the young guy, right? What, what, what advice would you give the 25-year-old um, videographer that is mulling, you know, leaving her job, the safe wage job, to go into the wide blue yonder? What, what advice would you give her? I would say um, don't, don't dive head on into that deep blue ocean. Don't dive on. Don't. Okay. Just because... Oh, everyone else has done that. I think, I think you have to do your work. You have to do your homework. Um, if you don't have the luxury of a safety net, uh, then you have a responsibility to yourself to really make sure that you're, when you take the next step out um, of a safe uh, a full-time job, that you're very clear where those opportunities and options are. So there's nothing to stop you from you know, burning the candle at two ends, right? Doing your job at the same time, exploring these opportunities, right? And so that when you're ready, you, you know, you take that step and it's not so scary or frightening. Yeah, so that reply is not the reply of a full-blown, true blue entrepreneur who takes risks of the yin-yang, right? That was the answer of a financial guy who was saying, hedge your bets, right? Don't, don't put all everything on black put some on red and then put some on black and then leave some on zero as well. <laughs> well, look, ultimately, um, whatever that you do, yeah. you have to have a passion for it. Okay. Otherwise, it's going to fizzle out. Does, does passion equate your skill? Ability? I think Because you, you can be good at, at tiddly wings or playing Monopoly. Can't make you money. you would be surprised. I think passion equates to, um, it, it, it will lead to ability. Okay, because you, you like doing it. Because you're better focused at it. and this is what you want to do and you're committed to it. Okay. And ability leads to you being ahead of the pack in that space that you're in. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think there's any fixed formula, um, but I think what everything you do everything that you enjoy doing, there's always a way to monetize and make a living out of that. Of course, yeah, because it's a new world, right? It's the 21st century. Who would have known that promoting pictures on an internet website would make you money, right? Yeah. It's called social media marketing. It's, so you It's got, a long tail, right? It's a long tail, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, what other advice? To, uh, spot now? to a new, to a, to a wannabe entrepreneur? To a, yeah, to a wannabe entrepreneur. Um, you're going to fail. Be right? resilient, right? You have to embrace those failures, right? So mentally, you have to be strong. Um, so while you're passionate in what you are doing, always make sure that you're also growing yourself in other ways. Adding skills. Um, adding skills. So whether or not it's taking a course um, or frankly, really growing yourself on the personal side. I think everything... Everything adds to eventually your ability as a person um, to grow your business or grow your, pa your, your passion and how you lead your life. Um, and, I, and again, um, I'm a Johnny come lately in that as aspect as well. I had a lot of inspiration from uh, teachers, gurus, and also my wife. But I think that part of it, your own individuality, your spirituality, getting to know yourself, I think that's a very uh, key aspect of growing as a person and being mature enough to understand why failures come your way or why successes come your way. You know? yeah. It doesn't get to your head. You know, just because 
you made a ton of money doesn't make you the smartest kid on the block. Yeah. Just because you've failed a couple of times doesn't mean that you're destined to be a failure. Yeah. It, everything happens as it should. Yeah. The other aspect that a lot of these self-help books don't have is the, is the mental aspect, right? Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, entrepreneurs generally, there's a difference between those that are made and those that are born. And then generally speaking as well, the ability to assume risk and to take on the uncertainties and volatility of, uh, of your own business is, is, is gargantuan. A lot of people, they can't take it. They, they can't take the uncertainty and they, they can't take the, um, the pressure of dealing and, ha and managing thousands of people. I know you have thousands of people under you, right? I know I can't do that because they've got all their whims and their emotions and their needs and their wants and people management skills is another thing because you might be good at something, right? But you, you're not necessarily you have the people management skills. So, so what are the top three things you need as a person to be an entrepreneur? Um, this is management speak, right? Isn't it? Well, I'm going to go the other way, you know. You know, for me, if I had advice, I would say um, your personal growth is actually much more important to determine your future and what you do. Okay. So, um, you talk about having attachment to, let's say you, you're growing your business. Why is it some people can't overcome a business failing? Whereas others uh, take it as a challenge and do it again and again. Right. My, my personal take on that is that how much we attach ourselves and identify ourselves with what we're doing in the material world. Right? It's, look, we all, we all have to make a living to survive. And ideally, you want to be able to, to engage in something that you're passionate about. But if you're completely identified with that business and for whatever reason that fails, is that you? And a lot of people see that as themselves failing, not the businesses failing. And then they take it too hard and that's once bitten twice shy and then they do go on to the next thing. So I think if, 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 if we see it as it's part of our, it's, it's, it's part of our growth, um, we're not attached to that and then we can move on um, I think that, that, if you ask me, is a much bigger portion uh, or formula for success than, than anything else, than any of these you know, management speak or philosophies or practices uh, can teach us. Yeah, so in my role, I've come across entrepreneurs and PLC owners for over 20 years, right? And I think there's two main characteristics that drive business people. The first and most obvious is money. They want to get rich and then they'll stay rich or they want to get from 10 million net worth to 100 million net worth. And then once you hit 100 million net worth, then it's the next benchmark, 1 billion net worth, right? Da -da 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 -da, right? Then the other kind, like the Elon Musk kind, where I don't think he's really driven by money. I think he, he's, he, he's not switched on by being a billionaire because he just sold all his houses, right? I think he's switched on by changing the world. He wants to solve problems. He wants to solve traffic. He wants to solve... Um, uh, outer space, he wants to solve whatever, energy management, right? Yeah. Dependence on fossil Dependence fuels. Dependence on fossil fuels, right? Sure. What about you? What, uh, what kind are you? Look, I think the biggest mistake, and, and we've all seen our fair share of tycoons yeah. that get attached to their success, attached to their status, and attached to the material things in life. So you're right, you know, when you're a millionaire, you want to be, you want to make a hundred million, you want to make a billion. Yeah. Look, if that drive someone, then I would say the quality of, of your life is really not going to be that great. Right? Okay, repeat that one more time. Let, let that sink in because that's a very big statement mm. that deserves a pregnant pause. <laughs> because people think money is happiness, right? That's bullshit. Absolutely. Bullshit. Do you know that I would say five years ago, I've actually stopped reading I mean, I used to devour management books and self-help books and all that. And I think I read enough to know that, you know, everyone has a point, but then that's it. That's just one point of view. Um, and, and frankly, all I read right now outside of work is um, spirituality, meditation, 
and and that actually really helps me manage what I do. You know, don't get, don't get attached to it. You know, if you know, losing millions or hundreds of millions, it's just it's something that you, you're not going to take with you anyway. Yeah, you right? can't take a billion bucks with you, right? Right. I mean, how can you? Right. Right. And and so, so you think it's such it's such a simple thing to understand, and it's the truth is right there. You can't take it with you, but most people you meet live life as if they're taking that along with them, right? And I think that's a big, big difference between some of these successful entrepreneurs. You see, like, I, mean, I think, I think uh, Elon Musk, I don't think he's set up, is he set up to be, I don't, I, don't, I don't think he gives a shit about money, actually. Yeah, 100 billion, the world of 100 billion. I don't think I, he cares. I don't, I don't think so, right? I think Mark Zuckerberg might care, but not him. I, that's my sense, right? So what are you reading? <laughs> I'm reading this book by Adya Shanti, which, who is an American, that turned monk, and um, so he's a Masali white guy. Yes, with an Indian name now. Yes, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. You I'm know, most serious. of the best writers are Masali for, for some reason, right? <laughs> they articulate themselves so well, yeah. and it's all about. You know, he, he doesn't talk about he doesn't talk about being a monk. He talks about being alive, being in this moment, knowing that whatever we have identified ourselves with is false, it's not real. So what are we really doing? What are we living this life for? Okay. Right? So where do we find meaning? I think there's the aspect of being passionate about what you do. So on, on my part, I love growing businesses and I love grooming or partnering with people and working with them to grow something. But right? don't you see the irony of this, right? Because to the 25-year-old videographer who wants to stop being a wage slave, right? And then you and I are like, let's just call it half a century, lah, okay? Let's just say it, roughly <laughs> give or take one or two years, right? Um, they'll say to you, oh, it's all very well and good for you. You've made your money, you know, you've got your car and your house or whatever. It's easy for you to now say, oh, money's not important. It's all about spirituality now. But these are guys who are like struggling to pay the rent and don't have any savings. Do you know what I mean, right? Yeah. So. So how do you square that? Are you saying then that everybody's got to go through the grinder and then you come out on the other side and then it's Maslow's law, lah, right? At the end of the day, do you know, because at the, at the very first level yep. is your human needs. Actually, going back to your, your can, initial can you question, shortcut? You go back to your initial question, which is yeah. if you knew now, if you know now what you knew yeah. then, yeah. Well, if you knew then what you know now, right? How would you change it? And I would say, look, I was relatively unaware as a, as a young boy or young man coming into the business world. And yeah. I'm just trying to learn things, trying to grow and trying to build stuff. And really getting attached to that idea, right? Yeah. And if I could have a different perspective, if I had guidance and I had practice of having a different perspective of things, I probably would have gone through my life Maybe I would have made the same mistakes, but I probably wouldn't have been as stressed. I paid a huge price for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in, whether or not in health, in relationships, in you know, in 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 in, in, in your general life, and I would so probably have come back to the same same point of where I am, but I probably would have been able to go with the flow because that's what life is about. Yeah. Yeah. And then back then, I just didn't. I just had one single goal. Which was to make money. Which was to be successful. Successful means money lah. Yeah. Right? Money or growing your business or you know. Material wants. I mean your car. I or think the house. money is just a measurement of, of, of what you've built. So what is success? What is the definition of success to the young person? I think for me success is living this moment. Uh, uh, acknowledging this moment and appreciating this moment that we have. So you and I in front of the cameras, having a cup of coffee and a cup of water. I'm enjoying yeah. this uh, uh, sorry, interview with you. <laughs> How are you advising your kids? What are you going to tell them? Are you going to tell them to study law? Or what are you going to do? How, what kind of wisdom do you impart to them? Because they are your most important product, right? It's not the company necessarily, it's the kids. What are you telling them? That's an interesting question because I just had this conversation with my teenage son. Yeah, how old is he? He's 
turning 13 in a week. Shit, dude. Uh, that's... Okay, so that's seminal, right? 13 is... That's yeah. when they, they kind of realise what's what. And things are changing inside as well. Yeah. So right. they're dealing with changes. Yeah. They're dealing with friends, dealing with relationships. They're dealing with what they're going to do. And there's all pressure in school. And are you going to be successful or not? You know? And ultimately, um, look, my wife and I would never tell our kid to study this or that. I think we've always said, find your passion, find your interests. And don't think about how much you're going to make. Don't think about the money, because that's really secondary. If you're able to find what you love doing, and at the same time not get lost or attached to that. So there's really two aspects. Find something you enjoy doing. So you're a videographer, you enjoy creating stuff, right? Telling a story. But at the same time, you've got to realize that this moment in your life is as it should be. And you want to appreciate this moment. You don't want to think about what I'm going to be five years down the road. Easier said than done, right? It's practice. Because if you're 13 and everything's all about what phone you have and what are you going to be when you grow up and what are you going to study, it's very hard for them to be kind of like almost like a jacket and hide because you're telling them to live in... Because I'm having the same issues with my son. He turns 13 in a year's time. Mm. You're, you're telling him it's everything is impermanent, right? That's what we're telling them, right? But at the same time, please, study hard, huh? because we want you to do well and it's cool. Do you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's no. a mind fuck for the guy, right? Um, I'll, for want of a better word. I, I will put it another way, which is, you have your job, right? We have a job, we need to make a living, we need to sustain ourselves. Yeah. This is your job, right? And if you're doing it, if you're embracing this moment, then you do it fully. Yeah. So if you're studying for science, study it, right? Embrace this moment, embrace your exam coming through, whatever it is. This, this is what you're supposed to do. But at the same time, the key is not to get carried away with who has the next phone or who's more popular or easier said than done. Or how again, much right? social media. Because you think about it, no one has ever been happy. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, we're trying to be rich, we're trying to make money, we're trying to be successful, we're trying to hire people, we're trying to, trying to have a freelance shop. Why? Because we're looking for happiness. Yeah. And what ultimately is happiness? Every, none of these things I'm going to give it to you. It's going to give you that moment of satisfaction, but ultimately what's happiness. So what we tr try and tell our children, my, my kid, is listen to yourself and the silence inside. Cool. And if you can do that... That is, that is huge, bro. So you take okay. a step back, okay. Okay. right? And that's where the phones mess us all up. Social media messes us it up. Does. Computers messes us up. Because you're not listening to yourself anymore, right? You're listening to someone else's video or, 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 or something on Netflix. And then you, you, you just, you, what, you, what happens is you separate yourself from everything else, from, 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 from creation, from consciousness, from everything else. And that's why people become unhappy. So rather than what he said in response to you, how did he look at you when you said these things to him? Did he take it on board? Did he look like he was like, what is that? What the hell is my father talking about? Or did he th really think to himself, interesting? Because what they say and what they think is a totally different thing. Especially when they're teenagers, right? He rolled his eyes at me. He rolled his eyes, he's like, <laughs> bullshit, right? Did he say that? No, he rolled his eyes did, at did me. It, did it seem that way? Or? And then the next step is then we engage in certain practices that helps him find that silence. Okay, okay. And I think if you ask me what, you know, ultimately is there a secret formula? I would say there's no secret formula to being successful, but I think undoubtedly uh, my own experience to being happy is to find that silence within you. And that ultimately is the you, you. So it doesn't matter what someone else says about you, when you found that silence within yourself, you are empowered to do anything. Okay, so Dr. Jared Lim, head honcho of two PLCs. If your son decides to be a homeless poet that walks barefoot in the streets of Zambia, painting murals, what are you going to, what are you going to say? If that's what's going to give him that satisfaction, you okay with it? I would embrace it. Hundred percent. Yep, absolutely. In fact, if you ask me, I think people that have embraced the creative side of their lives have far more potential to be happy. 
and ultimately that's what we're all looking for. Right? Yeah. So COVID, right? Hardest time, most challenging time economically speaking since 1929. Thousands of people, millions have all lost their jobs. It's either the best of times for those who can spot opportunities or the worst of times. How have you handled this? I would say, and just continuing from that conversation, yeah. and I know you're trying to steer away from that. No, no but just because they can be interlinked. They can they, be interlinked. They are interlinked. Yeah. I would say I've spent a lot more time um, within myself. You know, because frankly, appointments are by Zoom. You, you end up actually being able to have a lot more time for yourself. And what do you do with this time? You could you know, totally binge on Netflix or you could find what else helps you become a better or happier person. So I would say I've used that time to grow in many aspects, um, whether or not in skill set. So I've done some courses uh, within myself, so, you know, really reading and practicing um, those kind of, um, you know, more spiritually within yourself. And that really equips you to handle a lot of stuff that's happening now. The biggest thing about COVID is it's just pure uncertainty, right? With the exception of the next tycoon building, the next billion, <laughs> billion glove yeah. uh, manage, manufacturing facility, yeah. you know, no one knows when it's going to end, what's going to happen. But that's, a, but that's the thing, isn't it? Life has always been uncertain. We have never been able to predict the future. It's just that now it's, it's on an order of magnitude a million times yep. more than ever. Exactly. So it hits home so hard. Yeah. Life is uncertain. Life is uncertain. And as you say, people behave as if they're going to live a thousand years and take their billions with them. You can't. You, you're, he, you're here max 80, 85, 90 years. Right? Max, right? Hmm. After that, you're a vegetable. What's the bloody point? Yep. You know? Um, I know you meditate in the morning. What does it do for you? Um, it basically centers me a little bit more. Look, when you're dealing with I don't know, 100 issues every single day, the moment you wake up, yeah. you want to be centered. You want to know that these issues are going to come and go, but it's not going to change you unless you let it change you. Exactly. Right? So I wouldn't say I've got there yet, but that's what I'm aspiring to be. I want to be in the moment. I want to be, I want to be able to understand that you know, someone could have terminated my 26-year-old JV, <laughs> right? That could have been a billion-dollar project. Yeah. It's terminated. It's not going to be the end of the world. And what are you going to do, right? Yeah, what are you going to do right. about it? Same old you, right? Yes. It's, it's all how it's, it's all processed here, right? Um, how much how much time do you spend in the morning doing it? 20 minutes. And that's it. Bam, in and out. You've got to be really good at it, though, right? Because not everybody can do it well. I'm not good at it. No. I'm just I'm I'm just trying. Yeah. And ultimately, the whole point is don't think about if you're good or not. Okay. Don't even think about what you're thinking. Okay. You just you just do it, right? And you're not supposed to overthink this 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 practice at all. So you just clear your mind. Don't hold on to any. Other. You can't even think about clearing your mind. Okay. You just. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think about not thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Because then it comes back and backfires on you. So, <laughs> and and ultimately, what I've learned is it's not something you can articulate. It's you just have to take the first step, do a couple of breathing techniques, sit, you know, sit for a couple of moments of silence, and then just do it again and again. And then eventually, you learn to embrace it, and you love it, and you look forward to that. And that kind of, that kind of is my, you know, routine, to start the day. And if there's one thing I'm going to impart on my kid is this. Right? It took me 40-something years to figure this out, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if our children could learn it when they were a teenager. The importance of meditation and self-reflection and being aware and being in the moment. Yeah. And ultimately, look, you get, there's so many words to describe it. It's about, are you able to sit in silence with yourself? I think, I think that's, that's easily summarized. So it's not about religion or spirituality. It's about you yourself being in silence with yourself, and then everything else comes, comes with that. Do you think it's possible to be a professional success and also to be a self-reflective person? I think... Right? Because, because they seem to be two different parts of the pole. 
as a professional success, you're making bucket loads of cash, right? Profit margins, shareholder value, bungalows, plural, cars, plural, right? You've got no time for self-reflection because if you're self-reflective, you realize you can't spend all this money. You, you can't take all your cars and bungalows with you, right? Even though that's what we're going to talk about next. <laughs> um, you can't be both. You can't be a tree hugger that's rich. You can't. It's just not possible. This is why I believe, and I'm going to get in trouble with this, but I think of being, you, you can't be a person of faith and also be in business. I think you can't do that. So I would disagree with that. First of all, yeah? the term professional success is a conundrum in itself, right? Because how can you be successful if it's just purely on the material side of things? But that's, that's how we different. define it in the modern world. And that's the society that defines it. But is there anyone that says, I'm a raving professional success and I'm so goddamn happy, even though I've completely ignored my own personal side of, of, of my, my own personal growth. Yeah. I, I don't think there's such, there's, yeah. there, there, there's such a thing, right? Yeah. So I think it's just society glorifying. Yeah. Oh, look at this guy, look at how successful he's become. Yeah. And oftentimes these really rich guys are bloody miserable inside. Could be. I mean, Some of them, I, I, I look in their eyes and I can tell, right? <laughs> 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 but yeah, let's talk about money. Mm. Okay, let's talk about making money, right? Investing, because you can only make so much money in your job, in your whatever, right? You got to make it work for you, and this is what you used to do as a professional investor, right? Today, twenty twenty, end of twenty twenty, what is the one thing or the two or three things that is going to make you shit loads of cash if you invest for the next three years? Well, look, I've staked a big part of my the future of my career on energy storage. And I think that satisfies two aspects of what I'm looking for. On the one hand, we want to make the world a better place, right? And you know what's messing up our world? Our dependence on fossil fuels. It's very clear, energy storage is the answer to that. So if I can, if I can match my investments, or my business, my job, and coincide that with being part of that solution, I think that's personally a very satisfying thing. All right. So I would say <laughs> energy storage <laughs> because I'm in it. To me, that is one of the answers to making the world a better place. Okay. And, and because technology has, has, uh, has grown and evolved to the point where by now, it's made energy storage affordable enough that people can see that this is the future. But it's still investing in your own business, right? right? But what about investing um, in equities, in, in, in cryptocurrencies, in properties? You know, what are you doing with your own money, for example? Do you even, do in, do you even invest your own money anymore? Do you, or do you leave it to a professional manager? Well, what do you do? I'm probably not the best uh, model yeah. for investment practices because I've in basically most of my net worth is invested in my companies. I see. Okay. So, you're, you're so I'm betting on myself. You're doing the Bill Gates thing because Bill Gates famously once said that every single thing he made is into Microsoft and that's all he does. He doesn't do anything else. He doesn't buy stocks or bonds. He just buys Microsoft. And that's what you do? Um, I would say uh, a good, good portion of my own Okay. Uh, net worth is in the businesses that I'm in. Okay, so that's a bit of a gamble in itself. It seems like it, because if it doesn't happen or doesn't, you know, make it work, then then your net worth is dissipated. And it's happened in my life, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> and, but then you uh, come back, but, right? And, and that's a path that, that I've chosen. And ultimately, you can't take it away with you anyway. Okay. Right. So I'm just not, I suppose I'm not that conservative, prudent, you know, an investor that diversifies my portfolio. I see, I see, I because see. Because my, my personal conviction is that, look, when the shit hits the fan, no matter how diversified you are, it's going to go it's, to pots it's, anyway. It's going to stick, right? Yeah. <laughs> the shit. <laughs> Let's talk about energy storage because I've got a real, it's a real dichotomy, okay? I'm watching Long Way Up. I told you this, right? Um, Ian McGregor, mm. Charlie Borman, two best buddies. They're going from Patagonia, Terra del Fuego, to LA, south to north, right? They rode two Harley Davidson e-bikes 
and they were supported by two e-trucks, Rivians, okay? The charge wasn't sufficient. There was no charging stations along the way. Um, they were not very efficient. And at the end of the day, I think you've also, people, a lot of people in clean energy don't realize that there's a huge environmental cost to putting together electric vehicles, whether from the batteries or from the rare earths or from the composite materials, and as well as dealing with renewable material like, like batteries after they've terminated their useful life. Where do, you, where, do you, where do you dispose of them? I think a lot of people don't realize this. Sure. Um, and but, was, but it is a much, much lesser evil than drilling for fossil fuel. No, I, I wouldn't know. Okay, because the energy that you charge your vehicle with, that energy, for the most part, is either generated by coal or by gas or by nuclear, none of which are renewable in any way, shape or form. And nuclear, if you, if you get it wrong, you, you can die, right? How do we figure these things out? You're basically saying that, because we talk about ending the dependence on fossil fuels. Yes, and we want to. We have and to. what's the no biggest choice. factor that's going to do that is EVs. Because okay. you think about the largest consumption of fossil fuels is our transportation industry. Other than defecating buffaloes and cows. Sure. Yes. I'm talking about fossil fuels though. We're talking about fossil fuels. Yeah, because they emit not methane. About, yeah. Not about methane gases, right? Okay. Fossil fuels, right? <laughs> <laughs> so then you're saying, uh, what about all that environmental damage in, in um, producing these batteries or disposing of these batteries? Yes and charging these batteries. That's right. Right? Can it be solved in a lifetime? I think this is going to happen in the next 15, 20 years. Um, I read this research that says in the next 15 or 20 years, every ten one years. out of every two, was it 10 years? Will be an EV. In fact, will yeah. Will be an EV. Yeah. I think Volvo has told themselves, told customers, they're not going to be selling anything other than EVs within the next eight years. Right, um, and 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 I think there are some stats to show that once consumption of fossil fuels is reduced in cars on transportation itself, then that dependence on fossil fuels is is, is effectively ended because that is really the biggest cons consumer of it. Yeah, so I know there's interesting ideas when it comes to charging stations, right? I know you are thinking of the, about changeable batteries mm -hmm. so you don't actually rock up and then wait for the charge it could be half an hour even if it's a tesla station right um, you just rock up you just take off your battery change it for a new one and then off you go right that, that's that's huge but that doesn't solve the problem of um, disposing of the battery or the the environmental damage from creating that battery producing the battery well first of all where if you talk about our super batteries yeah um, we're talking about batteries that last typically 18 months okay. to now 10 years. Okay, so if you had to chuck it every one and a half years, now you just chuck it once every 10 years. Yes. Okay, and, interesting. And a lot of these, um, now, nowadays, in fact, a lot of batteries that we buy, and these are typical lead-acid batteries, okay. um, they're also reusable. So it's batteries that have lost their shelf life, they take some of the panels out and then remake it again. So I think that's all these, there are these practices and applications that, uh -huh. that can go towards um, not having to create another climate change issue because now the issue is we're producing so many more batteries, that itself is damaging the, 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 the environment, right? Yeah. So, I think there's, there's a lot of these protocols and LCPs that's, that's being put in place. Um, and But you think about it, like I said, it's, it's, it's really the lesser of the, much, much lesser of the evils of being a full-on petroleum guzzling car. Yeah. Right. Although there's something to be said about a 5-litre V8 mega truck that goes down the highway, but, <laughs> but, but that's a totally different story. Um, so, in essence, what someone like you is trying to do is trying to coalesce, right? Basically, your, your, your tree hugger that can also make a bit of money. Is that the business of the future? Is that how... Because I see a lot of social entrepreneurs around, right? Soup kitchens, um, 
education, right? Free for the poor, expensive for the rich. Eye hospitals in India, same thing, right? Do you think this is how business is evolving? I think if humans evolve um, individually and personally to not want to be so rich and so greedy, right? To be more equitable in their approach. Is that what you're saying? Um, look, I, I don't know if people make the decision based on how much money I want to make or how much oh they do I want, or, money I want to make or how much less money I want to make. I, I think, think they do it every day. I think if people make the decisions based on the right business to go into and something that you're passionate about, then a lot of that money, when it comes your way, that is a very satisfying thing. You know, so if you're asking from my personal point of view, um, as, as I've grown, I've, I've learned to make the choices whereby what I'm doing isn't in conflict with my personal beliefs, you know, and if, if, could, if those could merge together, I think that's, that's a big part of being a happy, fulfilled entrepreneur, whereby, you know, what you do and what you believe isn't, you know, at odds with itself. So that's quite Gandhi-esque, because I think Gandhi said, too many people think one thing, say another, and do something completely different. That's what he did, right? So if you're someone who says, if I think this way, I say the same thing and I do the same thing. For example, right? If I say, if I think to myself, I'm not racist, right? I think I love my fellow man and woman the same. I say the same thing and I do the same thing. A lot of people, they don't, a lot of people are very racist inside, but then they say, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Bullshit. Sure. Bullshit. They're sure. Lies, and right? I tell you, it's an aspect of social conditioning. Yeah. In school, in your families. You know, and, 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 and we don't know that. We don't know yeah. we're conditioned. We think that's yeah. us. Yeah. And then that and then these thoughts pop out. So again it's back to how much time do you really spend with yourself to be able to differentiate between what has been put into your head, that's what I call conditioning, and what's really you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in one generation, uh, let's just say we are the same gen we are the same generation, right? And my children's generation, they are so different. I never thought it'd be possible, right? In one switch, they are so different. And I think, I, I don't know whether this is possible. Their generation one below will be a different species, will be a different breed where they're not so greedy, they're not so mercenary, they're, they're not so plundering. They won't be so uh, evil on the earth. They won't be so evil on each other. Yeah, I think that's possible. Sure, you know? because conditioning can work the other way. Yeah, you can then recondition, right? right? And if schools and parents and families start focusing on these values, yeah. I think the next generation could, could come out differently. Okay. okay. But the way I see it now is they're being conditioned by their electronics. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, that's a challenge that we need to, you know, during this, co this, this pandemic, yeah. you know, I've known a lot of kids having mental issues. Yeah. You know, just because they spend all their time on electronics, they're not with their friends, and then they feel alone and, 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 and pressured. Yeah. yeah. Okay, a couple more minutes left. Um, what's in the store for Jared Lim the next 10 years? Mm. Well, let's, we're, we're talking about the next part of your life. It's the latter third already, right? It's the final, th I hate to say final, but okay, it's, the, it's, the, it's the next 30%, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, I've made it quite public now after everything that I've been through. You know, there's these various platforms that I'm very committed to. Yeah. I believe in it and I want to grow it. So, where Sinohan or Techno Access Concern were in a space that I'm fully committed to and I'm, and I'm happy spending my energies and time growing this because I think this is something that's going to better the earth. The other platform that I'm involved in is with my family's business, which is Country Rights. They have a huge land bank. The question is, how can we use today's know-how in technology, in, um, in connectivity, in, um, in, in, in even our 
the way we perceive how life should be lived, how can we use these experiences, lessons that we've learned, to grow a uh, property development company, an asset-heavy brick-and-mortar company. And that's the challenge we're doing. We're doing a transformation of, of, of that business. So I'm equally passionate about, about both, about, about what we're doing. Well, here's to saving the world first and making a bit of money next. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.